Okay, so today we'll be looking at the life and, most importantly, the writing of a man called Joseph Ritson, who lived between 1752 and 1803, and who was perhaps the most important man in the whole development of the Robin Hood legend. Now, Ritson was born in Stockton-on-Tees in 1752 to a poor yeoman family. As a child, he attended the local Unitarian Sunday School, where his talents were noticed. And this led him being, to him being apprenticed to a conveyancer in Stockton, after which his employer convinced him to seek employment in London, where he could find a more lucrative position. While in London, he was kept busy trying to advance in his chosen career, which he did, eventually obtaining a salary of £300 a year in the firm of Masterman and Lloyd. However, in his spare time, he conducted historical research into various subjects of English history. He was interested not in the high culture of people in times past, but in the, common culture, in the culture of the common man. And so he published many collections of ancient songs and poems, uh, such as the one you can see on the board, Ancient Songs from the Time of Henry III to the Revolution, and also others such as Pieces of Popular Poetry. He quickly established himself as an authority on many historical subjects, owing to his willingness to seek out very obscure primary sources from archives and libraries across the country. He was also cantankerous, fiercely critical of his right. Being from quite poor circumstances himself, he was ever ready to help a fellow man in need um, when necessary. If something could help to improve their condition, he would sometimes offer his legal services for free. One example of this is when, in 1788, Joseph Hanway asked Ritson to draft a bill, that's um, an act of parliament before it becomes law, a bill for the consideration of the politic, humane and merciful relief of distressed boys living in London, which would, among other things, have regulated the chimney sweep trade and made it safer for the boys. Having written Hanway's bill, Ritson actually refused to take any payment for it because it was a good cause. He also taught his nephew. Charity and benevolence have a much stronger claim upon a person than the superfluous indulgence of his own appetite. Never hesitate between a beggar and a halfpenny worth of nuts. Lay up treasure in heaven. Underneath the gentlemanly and scholarly facade, however, lurked a budding revolutionary. Ritson visited Paris in the summer of 1791 and became captivated by the teachings of Thomas Paine and the ideals enshrined in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. In a letter to his friend that summer, he wrote, Well, and so I got to Paris at last, and was highly gratified with the whole of my excursion. I admire the French more than ever. They deserve to be free, and they really are so. You have read their new constitution. Can anything be more amiable? We, who pretend to be free, you know, have no constitution at all. The French read a great deal, even the common people, such, I mean, as cannot be expected from their poverty, to have, to have had a favourable education, for there is now no other distinction of rank are better acquainted with their ancient history than the English nobility are with ours. Then, as to modern politics and the principles of the Constitution, one would think that half the people in Paris had no other employment than to study and talk about them. I have seen a fishwoman reading the Journal of the National Assembly to her neighbours, with all the avidity of Shakespeare's blacksmith. You may now consider their government completely settled, and a counter-revolution as utterly impossible. They are more than a match for all the slaves in Europe. 
When he returned to England in November 1791, Ritson made contact with several leading radical thinkers, including William Godwin, John Felwall and John Horn Tuck. Ritson was a big admirer of Godwin's political and philosophical works, but less so of Godwin's fiction. You have read his novel, Caleb Williams, I presume. He has got it sufficiently puffed in the critical review, but between ourselves, it is a very indifferent or rather despicable performance. At all events, unworthy of the author of political justice. I have no patience with it. It was during the 1790s also that in his letters, he began to address all of his associates as citizens, which was adopted from the French Revolutionary cal Calendar. While he admired Payne and Godwin, he wrote little on politics himself at the time. Pitt's terror, which curbed press freedom and placed restrictions upon freedom of assembly in the UK, was in full swing by the mid-1790s. Ritson himself had seen many of his revolutionary-minded associates in the dock for sedition, including John Horn Tuck and John Felwall, and he said in his letters, I find it prudent to say as little as possible on political subjects in order to keep myself out of Newgate. Newgate being, of course, the notorious jail in 18th century London. Yet one book which Ritson wrote has, in popular culture at least, outlasted the, names, the name of Godwin. In 1795, Ritson published Robin Hood, a collection of all the ancient poems, songs and ballads. Ritson's Robin Hood sounds like a dry historical work which gathered together all the primary sources relating to the life of the famous outlaw. It certainly fulfilled this function, but it was anything but a boring tomb. The most important part of the book was the life of Robin Hood, which he prefixed to the beginning of the work, in which he gave the biography of England's most most famous people's hero. Ritson transformed the prevailing image of Robin Hood in popular culture from being a small-time medieval outlaw who lived in the woods into a radical revolutionary bandit. It was the politics of the 1790s superimposed upon that of the 1190s where the rulers were veritable tyrants who denied people even the most simple pleasures in life because of harsh laws made by a narrow elite which only served their interests. As Ritson said in Robin Hood, The deer with which the royal forests then abounded, every Norman tyrant being, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, would afford our hero and his companions an ample supply of food throughout the year, and of fuel for dressing their venison, or for the other purposes of life they could evidently be in no want. The rest of their necessaries would be easily procured, partly by taking what they had occasion for from the wealthy passenger who traversed or approached their territories, and partly by commerce with the neighbouring villages or great towns. It was the medieval outlaw's duty, in effect, and by extension it was the duty of a 1790s revolutionary like Ritson, to make war upon the British establishment, to protect the desolate and oppressed, but such a course of life would not be easy for the medieval Robin Hood. In those forests, and with this company, Robin Hood for many years reigned like an independent sovereign, a, at perpetual war indeed with the King of England and all his subjects, with an exception, however, of the poor and needy, and such as were desolate and oppressed, or stood in need of his protection. When molested by a superior force in one place, he retired to another, still defying the power of what was then called law and government, and making his enemies pay dearly, as well as for their open attacks as for their clandestine treachery. It is not, at the same time, to be concluded that he must, in this opposition, have been guilty of manifest treason or rebellion, as he most certainly can be justly charged with neither. An outlaw in those times, being deprived of protection, owed no allegiance. His hand was against every man, and every man's hand against him. These forests, in short, were his territories. Those who accompanied and adhered to him his subjects. The world was not his friend, nor the world's law, 
and what better title King Richard could pretend to the territory and people of England than Robin Hood had to the dominion of Barnsdale or Sherwood is a question humbly submitted to the consideration of the political philosopher. In other words, who says that any king has any right to lord his authority over any patch of land? Robin Hood's physical force resistance to a tyrannical king was simply the actions of a true patriot. Ritson signed off his biography of Robin Hood by extolling the outlaw's virtuous and heroic acts. Such was the end of Robin Hood, a man who, in a barbarous age and under a complicated tyranny, displayed a spirit of freedom and independence which has endeared him to the common people, whose cause he maintained, for all opposition to tyranny is the cause of the people, and, in spite of the malicious endeavours of pitiful monks, by whom history was consecrated to the crimes and follies of titled ruffians and sainted idiots, to suppress all record of his patriotic exertions and virtuous acts, will render his name immortal. With respect to his personal character, it is sufficiently evident that he was active, brave, prudent, patient, possessed of uncommon bodily strength and considerable military skill, just, generous, benevolent, faithful and beloved or revered by his followers or adherents for his excellent and amiable qualities. Were movie and television producers honest, all modern Robin Hood predictions would give due credit to Ritson for his work. Ritson's work had a profound effect on successive portrayals of Robin Hood, who was, after Ritson's 1795 book, envisioned less as an outlaw and more as a freedom fighter, standing up for the people's rights against tyrannical elites. Indeed, the name of Robin Hood might have gone the, other w the way of other medieval outlaws, such as Eustace the Monk, Adam Bell, Clim of the Cloth, William of Cloudsley. These outlaws were likewise celebrated in medieval popular culture, but have disappeared from public notice except amongst academics. What is even more admirable about Ritson is that, while other British radicals slowly abandoned their support of revolutionary ideals after the Reign of Terror, Ritson remained true to his beliefs till the end of his life in 1803.